Good evening and welcome to the service this evening at Zion Baptist Church, Bedworth. We are again continuing to look at the book of Ruth and this evening we're going to read once again the first chapter of that book. So the book of Ruth and chapter 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Marlon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. She was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Marlon and Chilion also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. And she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and, lift, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And, she, and they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go. For I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope. If I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons. Would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. Norfa kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, nor to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death part you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. I will continue to consider something of this chapter in a little bit, but before we do, we're going to come to prayer. Let's pray. Gracious, loving, mighty and merciful Lord God, we come before you again this evening in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We acknowledge that he alone is the, his alone is the name by which we may come. That we come as sinners, guilty before you. We come to a God who is holy and righteous and pure and just. And yet, dear Lord, we come in the name of your Son because of all that he has done. Because you have sent him into this world as that great sacrifice for sinners. That he has taken upon himself that great role of high priest where he mediates and intercedes on behalf of those who come in his name. And dear Lord, it is with gratitude we come this evening. We come to wish, to praise and to, to worship you. We come to acknowledge your goodness to us. We thank you that once again we are able to gather together around your word, separated though we are by distance. We thank you that we have your word available to us, that we are free to read it and proclaim it and free to consider the truths it contains. We thank you that although we are separated, we may come together around the throne of grace. We thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ is a saviour who is not bound by a place, but that wherever his people are, there he too is found. And O oh Lord, it is the presence and the blessing of Christ that we pray for most of all this evening. That wherever we are, wherever we are listening, that we may know the blessings of Christ. That Christ may draw near and encourage us. That Christ may draw near and correct if that is what is needed. That Christ may draw near and strengthen and comfort. O oh Lord, bless us, we pray. We do pray for our nation, we pray for the, the day when once again we are able to meet freely around your word in person. O oh Lord, we pray that the lockdown will continue no longer than is absolutely necessary. We pray for wisdom for our leaders and for those who are seeking to uh, procure a vaccine to relieve the effects of the vaccine, of the pandemic. O oh Lord, we pray that you may bless us and bring us once again to get fellowship together. For we ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this evening we continue to consider the return of Naomi from uh, Moab to Bethlehem, as it is recorded here in this first chapter of Ruth. <clears throat> and what a difficult and searching chapter it is turning out to be. When I first thought about preaching through this book, I imagined a series uh, which would be focused on the great love of Christ and the glories of his redemption as we see it in the relationship between Ruth and Boaz. But as we've started in this first chapter, we find a very different emphasis. We find a chapter full of folly and foolishness found throughout this family of Elimelech, his two sons and his wife. And that theme continues this evening. Last week we started to think of the wife of the family, Naomi, and we considered those encouragements that she had had to return to the land of Israel and to God's people. Well, as we read on, into this chapter, we find her a very difficult character to assess. At times, she speaks the language of God's people. We see that in verse 8 as she prays that the Lord would deal kindly with these two daughters in law, Ruth and Orpha. We find it again in verse 9 as she prays that God will grant that they find rest in the house of a husband. She comes across as someone who has concern for these two ladies. In verse 9, we find that as Naomi encourages them to return to their homes, these ladies lift up their voices and weep, and they commit to return with her. And yet she responds, not in joy and encouragement, but with the words of verse 11, 
which we will consider this evening as Naomi tells her daughters-in-law to turn back. Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? We find here in these words of Naomi an individual whose advice to these two ladies disregards the place to which she is going. Why will you go with me? She asks. What is there for you in the place that I am going to? What could possibly be of advantage to you in Bethlehem? The implication is that there will be no good that would come to Ruth or Orpha by returning with Naomi. Has she forgotten already the encouragement for her to return that we thought of last week in verse 8? That the Lord had visited his people? Naomi was returning to the place that had been visited by the God of heaven. She was going to return to the people who were loved by that God. She was going back to the place where the worship of God was undertaken and where his word could be found and taught and where people sought to follow it and to put it into practice. And yet it seems these things were as nothing to her as she considers her daughters-in-law. It appears as though she has no concern for their souls. Her only concern is for their welfare in this life. I can't give you a husband, is her reasoning. Therefore don't come with me. Could she see, or could she not see, any of the privileges and any of the blessings that were to be found in Israel amongst the people of God? Did she not think it was possible that the great God of Israel could provide for these women? And you may think we are being somewhat harsh and unfair on Naomi. But we need to look at the consequences of her words. We find in verse 14 that Orpha heeds her advice and returns to Moab. And even as she does so, solemnly Naomi, with apparently no concern, foresees the likely outcome as she declares to Ruth in verse 15 look your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods if that is in fact what happened then Orpha went back to idolatry she went back to live the life of an idolater. And when she died, she would have been condemned by that sin for an eternity in hell. And Naomi was responsible for turning her back from the hope that could have been found in Israel. We need to understand that we cannot divorce our words and our actions from the eternal consequences that may flow from them. Naomi disregards where she is going and she dismisses where she has come from. 
What is it that she expected these women to find if they returned to Moab? Yes, they might find another husband. Would he be a believer and a worshipper in the God of Israel? Would they find the word of God taught and followed in Moab? Would they be encouraged to worship and to follow him there? Had the long years that Naomi had spent in Moab taught her absolutely nothing of the idolatry of the people that lived there and the end to which that idolatry would bring them? What we're seeing here in this verse are the consequences of Naomi's long separation from the people worship and word of God. It's as though she can see no difference between staying in Moab and returning to Israel. And here in Naomi, we see one of the great issues that faces the church today. A lack of discernment. An inability to distinguish between the kingdom of Christ and the world which lies outside of that kingdom under the influence of Satan. We live in days where for many, as long as you name the name of Christ, it doesn't matter where you are found. It doesn't matter what you do, the life you live or the company you keep. As long as you name the name of Christ, you can disregard the meeting of Christ's people. You can disregard the faithful proclamation of his word. You can disregard his commands and his teachings, living as you please, just so long as you confess with your mouth. That is the world we live in today. That is so much of what the church encourages. Where is the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart, bringing conviction of sin and the burden of guilt into people's lives? It's disregarded. Where is the work of Christ on the cross? His suffering for sin and his death and resurrection. It's not necessary for faith of such people. It is disregarded. Orpha, no doubt, returned to Moab with some knowledge of the God of Israel and of his word. I have no doubt she returned to Moab with the memory of the words of Naomi's prayer for the Lord's blessing upon her. And yet, as far as we know, she lived out her life separated from all of the blessings and all of the privileges that were to be found in Israel. How many are found in a similar place? having been turned back from seeking Christ by those who are unable to discern the difference between proud, self-confident human faith and a Christ-centred, Christ-given faith. We've noted with Orpha, this failure may carry eternal consequences for those who are misled and misdirected. What a reminder we have here before us of the seriousness and the importance of a faithful gospel witness that points away from the world and away from ourselves and towards the Lord Jesus Christ as the only hope for sinners. Sadly, it's not just in the false church that such an attitude is to be found. There are plenty of Christians who seem to have little or no regard for the place where Christ's people meet. 
They have little regard for the place where his word is loved, taught and proclaimed. They have little regards for the place where Christ himself is often to be found and where Christ so often feeds his people. The church, as it gathers together, such Christians, by their actions, witness, as Naomi witnesses here, why will you go there? They seem to have little or no regard for the blessings and privileges to which they have access. How different such individuals are to those early believers we read of in the book of Acts who continued steadfastly in fellowship so that they are found in that second chapter and verse 46 continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God. If this evening you are a Christian who has little regard for the meeting together of God's people, if you are a Christian who has little regard for the proclamation of the gospel, as Christ's people gather together, then you cannot expect your witness to be heard. If you yourself have no regard for Christ's people, why would you expect others to listen to you? If you have little regard to sit under the word that is proclaimed, why do you think your witness to others will encourage them to do so? How do you view the privileges and the blessings of coming together as a church under the headship of Christ? Are these freedoms and opportunities dear to you? Do you look forward and long during the week for the next gathering together of his people around the word of Christ? Or are these occasions of no significance to you? And week after week you disregard them. Do you seek every opportunity? To bring those you love into the company of God's people and under the preaching of his word? Or is your only interest in their success and advancement in this world? Naomi's witness to Ruth and Orpha. It disregarded the place she was going to. It dismissed the state of the place she was encouraging them to return to. And secondly, her witness discouraged them from going with her. Turn back is her advice. Not only does she disregard the benefits and the privileges that would be enjoyed in Israel and the reality of what the return to Moab would entail, but we find Naomi actively seeking to discourage them. She tries to send them back once. In verses 11 to 13. And she fails. So she tries a second time. And succeeds in convincing Orpha. Why is Naomi so determined to discourage these women from accompanying her back to Israel? What is it that drives this attitude of discouragement. If 
find two reasons for it here in this verse. Firstly, discouragement flows when we look at what is missing and not what is there. Naomi discourages Orpha and Ruth because she believes they will not find a husband if they come with her. That is how she starts to discourage them in verses 8 and 9. Return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. You won't get a husband following me. Therefore turn back. How easy it is to become discouraged when we look and we find the things that are missing and in doing so we ignore the things that are there you know here at uh, Zion Baptist Church in Bedworth we are a small fellowship and how often we hear those who are discouraged from meeting with us or remaining with us or discourage others from coming to meet with us because of what they perceive is missing. How often we've heard people say they can't come because we don't have a musician. They won't come because we don't have a program of social activities. They won't come because we don't have single people of the same age or the same education as them. Or they won't come because we don't have families of the same age. Now I'm sure all of these are perfectly valid reasons in the minds of those who come to such decisions. But just like Naomi, the reasoning is that they look at what is missing and they forget what is important. I've never had a single person who has told me they are discouraged from coming because of what is not here ever ask or inquire whether this church seeks to honour Christ, whether this church seeks to preach his word faithfully, whether this church seeks to proclaim the gospel to sinners, whether the people who meet here are fed and blessed by his word. Now if these things were missing from this church or from any other church, large or small, then you would have every reason to be discouraged from meeting. See, these are the things which should drive such decisions whether to recommend or attend a particular church whether it is here in Bedworth or elsewhere but for so many discouragement comes or discouragement is given because just like Naomi it is the peripherals that dominate the thought process the things that are not, rather than the things that are. Wherever you are this evening, do not be discouraged by whatever is lacking in a church, but rather look for what is necessary. Naomi's discouragement comes from looking at what is missing. But it also comes from looking at herself and not looking to God. The verse that we're looking at finishes with these words, Are there still sons in my womb?
It was the limitation of Naomi's ability to provide husbands for them that discouraged her and caused her to discourage them. She could see no further than the impossibility of her providing. She did not think it possible that God could act and provide. Had she forgotten the laws concerning the provision of an heir to those who died childless? Those laws which at the end of this book would be the means by which Ruth would become the wife of Boaz? Or were her circumstances such that she felt as though the blessings of God had been removed forever from her? Well, whatever the reasoning, just like Peter as he walked on the water and his eyes were diverted from Christ, doubts and discouragement set in. You know, the great enemy of souls is a master discourager. He is one who is more than willing to take advantage of such occasions. Satan enjoys nothing more than to kick those who are already down and he will take every opportunity to turn our attention to ourselves, to our weaknesses, to our failings, to our wanderings, to our sins and to the consequences of our sins in order to distress us and turn us away from coming to Christ. You can be sure that Satan will be quick to tell you there is nothing you can expect from the hand of Christ. If this evening you are a sinner burdened by guilt, if you are crying out to Christ for mercy, then you can be sure Satan will be there whispering to your soul and telling you you are too far sunk in sin, that you are beyond the help of Christ, that Christ will not hear your call, that there is no hope for you in him, that your sins are too great, that you have stayed away too long. You are a saint who has wandered from Christ and in sorrow and distress are seeking to return, then you can be sure Satan will draw near and will let you know it's too late for you. That he will tell you that you have followed and set yourself on the path of Judas. That there is no more forgiveness for you. That as you have turned away from Christ, so Christ will turn away from you. This is the reality of your life this evening. You're struggling and discouraged and fearful of coming to Christ, of being rejected. Then listen again to the words of Christ. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing. Be encouraged by the words of the disciple whom Jesus loved. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do not allow words of discouragement to turn you back from coming to Christ because Christ guarantees a welcome. Read the rest of this book of Ruth if you've not yet done so and look at what God in his sovereignty had in store for Ruth despite all of the discouragement she faced and she received from the mouth of her mother-in-law and what discouragement she did face when it became clear that Ruth could not be persuaded. Naomi has no words of encouragement or gratitude to her. But rather we read in verse 18. 
she stopped speaking to her. You will not find a single word of encouragement for Ruth from the lips of Naomi anywhere in this first chapter. What a sad indictment of the love that Naomi professed to have for her. How different are the words of Christ. You will find no discouragement in his words. You will find no turning away to the, of those who cry to him. You will find no rejection of those who come to him. Read the Gospels. See the compassion that he shows. See the patience that he shows. See the willingness with which he goes to the cross for sinners. See the forgiveness he gives to those who come to him in sorrow. Turn away. From yourself and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for he is indeed able and he is willing to save and to redeem all who call upon him turn back my daughters why will you go with me are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands. What a sad witness Naomi gave to her two daughters-in-law as she disregards the place where she is going and she is dismissive of what they will find if they return to Moab. And in disregarding both of these things, how discouraging she is towards them. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious and merciful Lord God, we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ is an encourager of those who are weighed down and distressed. That the Lord Jesus Christ welcomes and encourages and invites all who are heavy laden and burdened to come to him because he will give them rest. O oh Lord, may we indeed learn the lesson of Naomi and may we be those who are enthusiastic to point people to where Christ may be found in the gathering together of his people around his word. May we be those who encourage and may there be found in us nothing that would turn anyone back or encourage them to do so. We pray now for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit may be with us each. We ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen.